For this conference, we choose to focus on our third priority, increasing SMEs access to markets. More specifically, this conference will focus on remaining obstacles for SMEs to benefit from e-commerce in the single market. The single market provides business opportunities in a market larger than the USA. Still, companies, and especially SMEs, do not tap its full potential. If you look, for example, at the sales of goods, less than 10% of EU companies sell cross-border within the EU, and in the majority of them limits itself to only three different member states. Um, I will mention it that we have a translation in, in English, in French, and in German, and if you are not so familiar uh, with uh, the English language, you can uh, choose one of the translations. French is uh, cabin number three, German is number one normally, okay, and uh, English um, it's, then it's two. Let's continue. The single market provides, I mentioned it, um, uh, it's, 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 it's larger than the US market and that is very important. We improve that. When it comes to online sales, Europe still lags behind US and Asian markets. Uh, are quickly catching up. Therefore, the question is, what are the problems and what could we do about them? Of course, there are first of all practical obstacles such as language barriers or long delivery times and mere cultural differences might play a role as well. However, equally important are regulatory obstacles such as tax regulations, administri administrative requirements, and the lack of knowledge of the legal situation in other member states. These regulatory issues are particularly burdensome for SMEs, which often do not have a legal department and which therefore have to seek costly external services. The obstacles that need to be overcome in order to boost e-commerce in Europe can be summarized with two words, complexity and legal uncertainty. The first panel of this conference will focus on the complexity of cross-border business transactions. Examples for complexity include fragmented sales law, different national standards for electric, electronic signatures, electronic payment, and delivery. In our manifesto for a comprehensive European SME policy, the ALDE Group supports a common European sales law to which companies can restore resort voluntarily in order to reduce cross-border transaction costs for SMEs. This would also have a positive impact on e-commerce. Still, stakeholders do not seem entirely convinced of this optional instrument. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion on this in the first panel. We had discussion, for example, the uh, uh, British SMEs are very are in favor on the common sales law and the Germans are very careful, uh, some say yes, some say no. So I'm sure we will have a very interesting discussion on that issue. We already have a European directive on e-signature and European e-signature standards, but e-signatures are rarely used across borders as they lack legal certainty and interoperability. The European Parliament has recognized this problem and recently adopted two resolutions calling for an ambitious development of e-signature systems. The Commission adopted its proposal for a new regulation on e-signature only on Monday, so very much in time for this conference. Furthermore, the remaining lack of trust in the security of electronic payments by consumer makes it difficult for companies to attract trade in another member state to their own. As a first step to tackle this problem, the European Commission published a green paper in January, which looks into technological solutions to make an e-payment more secure. So now it's the right time to influence forthcoming policy proposals on this issue. On the second panel, we will focus on legal uncertainty for businesses and consumers. Legally, uncertainty can arise, for instance, from missing possibilities for alternative distributions, fragmented consumer rights, and difficulties with the recovery of outstanding payments. The negotiations of the Consumer Rights Directive last year showed how difficult it is to harmonize consumer rights in the EU. 
Nevertheless, we managed to achieve common rules for e-commerce, such as for the right to repeal a contract. This will make it easier for SMEs to cross-border business in Europe. Now it's up to the member states to implement the directive without creating additional barriers. The same can be said about late payment directive, which will be increased legal uncertainty for companies to be paid on time by their business partners in EU countries and must be implemented by the member states by March 2030 at the latest. I would say the earlier, the better. I see, uh, I, I have heard Italy has implemented it and um, Germany is an ongoing process. Um, so I hope uh, we need 2030, but when you think, because when you think that, for example, the Greece hospital are paying after three years, so you need this transition period because for that it will be very tough to pay within 30 days what is a requirement of the late payment directive. The Commission proposes to create European account uh, preservation order to facilitate cross-border debt recovery has been under discussion since last July and unfortunately agreement seems to be difficult. But now we can fast and low cost recovery of outstanding payments by done best, be done best. How can consumers solve disputes with SMEs without having to go to court? The European Commission has tabled proposals on alternative dispute resolution, ADR, and online dispute resolutions, ODR, to try to solve this problem. We will hear in this second panel from our distinguished speakers how successful they feel these proposals are in offering solutions to these questions. We would like to keep this session as li uh, lively as possible. Therefore, we will start with impulse statements of about five minutes, followed by a panel discussion. Then I will open the floor for questions of participants. Unfortunately, Commissioner Cruz has to cancel her participation, but now please welcome the speakers of our four, four, first panel, which have which I have to honor to chair. We will start with Mr. Michael Schotter, the legal advisor in the cabinet of Vice President of Commission Vivian Redding. We then will move to Ben Butters, Director of UN Affairs of Eurochambers, then Hannah Mellin, Legislative Council for Europe of eBay. At eBay had the floor. Paul Timmers, he will join us of ITC, addressing socialized uh, social uh, challenges of DG Information Society of the European Commission. Then we have Tim Benjamin kissel zenner in charge of marketing and export at the German SME Strandkorb work, which sells vintage furniture through its online shop and already benefits to some extent from the single market, exporting to nine European countries. And last but not least, we have Dr. Cherry Wigming, Vice President, B2, uh, B2 Consumer, Parcel and International Production Conception at Deutsche Post, DHNL. Mr. Jada, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a great uh, privilege to be invited here. Um, the two sessions are uh, divided up, but uh, uh, in a sense, they, they should all be sort of joined together in one sense, because overall, what we have to tackle here is the challenge of the single market and especially how to optimize uh, our use of the single market. It's the greatest asset we have in, in, in Europe. We have this market of 500 million uh, citizens and consumers, and it's our challenge to, to optimize that to, to its full potential. And I don't think we're, we're at that stage yet where we can say with satisfaction that we're doing that. Um, I, I say that on the basis that we're, we still find from our figures that nine out of ten companies still do not venture cross-border. Um, the questions why they do that will come to, uh, I'm sure, in the course of this, of this session. But uh, I, in my intervention now, will focus on the common European sales law, but that's not to say that it's to be seen in isolation from all the other aspects that have just been raised. The, the alternative dispute resolution is certainly a partner initiative to the proposal that the Commission came up with on the common European sales law, as is the e-signature, because, of course, one of the key sort of uh, potentials of the uh, proposed common European sales law is its capacity to work online. So why did the Commission come forward with this proposal for uh, a common European sales law? 
Well, it did so on the basis that uh, we still saw from, from our uh, appraisal, from our impact assessment, that there are serious barriers that uh, need to be overcome. The Commission had been working on these barriers uh, uh, over many years, and that is the, the very reason why it came forward with its uh, proposal for a, a Consumer Rights Directive. And the Consumer Rights Directive went some way in, in resolving some of those barriers. But I, I think it would be fair to say that it didn't go all the way. And we still, uh, with the final result of the Consumer Rights Directive, which is a very, very good piece of legislation insofar as it goes, but I think it still leaves many areas of contract law, and uh, our analysis shows this, many areas of contract law which have not been harmonized, which have not been touched. Now, in the traditional way of doing things in the approach that we took with the Consumer Rights Directive, we could have gone for a, a traditional harmonization approach based on full harmonization. But we saw quite understandably, I think, that there are some limits to that traditional me method of harmonization. And so with this uh, proposal for a cons uh, common European sales law, we've come forward with a new approach, an innovative approach, an approach based on an optional instrument which um, in the first place businesses, and let's face it, we've directed this principally at small businesses because they're our, our target audience. They make up uh, uh, the vast bulk of companies in the European Union. Uh, we want them to, to have this as an option, not something that they have to meet all the requirements of, but if they see the benefits for them in venturing across border, uh, then they would opt for this, and it's there as a, something they can choose. Uh, and why do we think that this could be attractive for them? Well, it could be attractive for them because when a business um, goes across, market, across border, uh, it has uncertainty, it has risks, it faces uh, questions about the other legal regime in which it might be transacting. And we know, of course, uh, and we can come to this later in the, in the discussion, that we have various regulations, for example, in the B2C field, we have the, the Rome 1 regulation, but also in the B2B context, there are uncertainties. Um, and to minimize those uncertainties so that uh, a small business um, does not have to understand 26 <coughs> other legal regimes, we thought it would be uh, uh, a good idea to offer the potential to, to, to go for a single, an, an alternative regime. So you, you understand one other regime, which represents a vast saving, because we calculate on average in our impact assessment that to get a, a legal advice, to understand another legal regime, costs on average 10,000 euros per legal regime. Now, if you multiply that for 26, that's quite a lot of money. And if you take into account what this means for a small business, this can amount to a very, very large amount of its sort of annual turnover. Um, we calculated in our impact assessment that if you were to venture just into three new markets, this could amount for a small or micro business up to one-fifth of your annual turnover. So you can see there the chilling effect that um, contract laws uh, and the uncertainty about how they might impact on your, on your business, on the, your standard terms and conditions, what this impact might be. So there's a big saving there for businesses if they choose it. Um, we focused our uh, optional instrument very much on sales law, on the areas where we thought that there would be the biggest impact for the internal market, sales law, and we have quite deliberately uh, pitched it at a high level of protection because quite frankly what we are doing here to give the added value, the internal market added value, you have to be able to have this, this set of contract law rules applying in a way that breaks down the regulatory barriers in B2C in all the different member states. Now you're only going to be able to do this if you have a regime which is a, a regime offering a high level of protection. This is not a mechanism for a sort of backdoor liberalization. It shouldn't be seen as that. And I don't think the companies that would be seeking to, to opt for this would want that either. The benefits for, for companies, for small companies, is that this is the key that on, unlocks the internal market. Um, and it's, a, it, it's, as I said, a, a quality product. And I, I think with this, our impact assessment shows that on conservative estimates, this measure can help uh, fill what is, for the moment, the, the, the lost trade. 
the lost trade, we calculate on, on a conservative basis that that amounts to, to 26 billion of um, transactions in the internal market, which at the moment are, are lost because of the uncertainties of uh, contract uh, law. And incidentally, coming back to something uh, you said, Mr. Kreisman, which I entirely agree with, yes, there are other barriers in the internal market. We know very well that there are delivery costs, there are language barriers, some of which we, 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 we can't tackle and we wouldn't want to tackle, for example, language, although incidentally this common European sales law does in some ways facilitate matters on that front. But contract law barriers and uncertainties relating to contract law are, in according to our understanding and our surveys, fundamental to what chills businesses' um, desire to, to, to move cross-border. We see this as, these are some of the most prominent uh, disincentives for businesses to move cross-border. And that's why we think that there is a big added value here uh, in terms of the single market. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to Mr. Ben Butters, Director for European Affairs at Eurochambers. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Kreutzmann. Um, well, firstly, let me say that um, Eurochambers has been pleased to um, endorse ALDA's Boost SMEs campaign. We thought it was a very good initiative and fully supported the three, th the three um, pillars, the smart regulation pillar, the access to finance pillar and the market access pillar, um, which very much correspond with our own priorities as, as the European Association of Chambers of Commerce. Um, and in connection with that, we've been very grateful to Mr. Koitzman and his and his uh, Sebastian and his team for their constructive engagement with us on the the Cosme report that they're currently drafting, which is the European SME program that's that's currently under deliberation in the European Parliament, which which again tackles some of these these key issues. Um, Within the specific pillar of access to markets, which, is, as Mr. Koitzman said, we're, we're concentrating on today, um, you've certainly tackle, you're certainly addressing some of the key problems in, in, in today's discussions. There are, of course, others, and we're looking forward to the Commission's uh, governance package on Friday. We believe that implementation of existing internal market legislation is one of the fundamental priorities in completing the internal market. It's not so much... Um, in fact, we think this new governance package is potentially more significant than the, the new Single Market Act that we're expecting in, in September. It's really about implementing and delivering the many pieces of legislation correctly, um, in our view, rather than, than, than developing new ones. Of course, some new ones are indeed needed, but nonetheless, focus should be on, on doing what's there already properly. Um, we're also very interested in the completion of the patent dossier. Um, unfortunately, this has become a symptom of, of European inertia over recent years, and we believe that in one very easy move, the Council could, could turn that into a, a real symbol of European dynamism if they can make a, reach an agreement on the, the slightly petty issue of where the court should be located at the next European summit at the end of June. So we're really hoping that the Danish presidency succeed with making a breakthrough on that. Turning to the issues today, I'm, um, I'm also going to address the issue of the, the common sales law proposal as well as the e-signature um, directive and the issue of trust services for electronic transactions. There are a couple of issues which you invited me to discuss which we're not following so closely, so I'll leave them to people on the panel who are far more qualified than me to talk about uh, payment systems and uh, deliveries. But on the issue of, of the common European sales law, um, there has been uh, an argument among some people that this is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Um, I don't think we would go that far. We certainly recognise that, that the uh, uncertainty about contractual regimes is an issue for SMEs. But equally, I don't think we would go as far as Mr Schotter in saying that it's the key to unlocking the internal market. We think it's part of the problem, but there are many other obstacles to the SMEs, to SMEs being able to fully exploit the uh, benefits of the, of the single market. Um, our position is, uh, perhaps reflects the, the, the comments of Mr. Koitzman about the differences among, among businesses in different member states. Um, there are differences within the chambers to, to their view on this, but in general I think we support the concept, the idea of a common sales law for Europe, um, and we believe, as I said, that it certainly has potential to boost cross-border sales, um, and as Mr. Schotter said, has po possibly particularly um, strong benefits uh, potentially for, for smaller businesses. 
but we do have a number of reservations about the, the proposal as it stands. Um, we firmly believe that the relationship with the Rome 1 regulation has to be clarified. Um, if the aim of the regulation is to, to preclude the application of Article 1 of, of Rome 1, that really needs to be stated far more clearly um, in the proposal than is the case at the moment in order to avoid um, creating more doubts. Um, we believe that the explanatory notes are, are somewhat vague and open to interpretation. It uses terms like good faith, fair dealing, reason, reasonableness, all of which are, as I said, very much open to interpretation. And we think that, um, they, that, that that's potentially problematic. Um, and the text in general should be made clearer and simpler. Um, the objective of the Commission was to make this instrument user friendly so that businesses could use it without having to hire lawyers. But the proposal is actually very complex and there are lots of cross-references between provisions and, as I said, vague legal terms, which, which are, um, are potentially um, a dream for, for lawyers and, and, and a nightmare for, for SMEs. Um, we believe it's essential that the right balance between consumer protection and competitiveness of traders is struck. We don't think that's the case at the moment. Um, and we need to introduce a clear hierarchy of remedies, for example, um, replacement and repair need to be given priority and there needs to be a smaller number of, of information obligations in, in the proposal. And we also believe that it could be useful to develop model contracts. We've been discussing this with other business organisations, also with consumer organisations. We think that this is a, a useful option and also standard clauses. Um, and they should be perhaps based on the, the common European sales law and that could be translated into all official languages. As Mr Schotter said, language does remain an obstacle as well. Um, because it's very expensive for SMEs to, to, to access legal support in drafting their contract terms, of course. So we think that these issues really need to be taken into account by the Commission, by the Parliament and by the Member States. Um, and really we need to remember that if this is going to fly, if this proposal is going to have uptake and, and, and traction, the businesses need to be convinced of its, of its value and its real added value to their day-to-day -day business. Then on the second issue of, of electronic uh, trust services for electronic transactions, we were, we were very encouraged by the Commission's proposal um, for a regulation on trust services earlier this week. Um, the implementation of the e-signature directive, which is, which is 12 or 13 years old now, has been very uneven, has led to some important, some significant disparities, and has thus slowed down the, the development of a single market for electronic transactions, which we think is, is really a critical obstacle to the development of the internal market in digital goods and services. Um, to take one example which we often cite, France makes it very difficult for companies with a non-French electronic signature certificate to access their electronic public procurement. We've, we've actually raised this issue with the Commission and they're looking into it at the moment, um, but we think this is somehow symptomatic of these problems in the disparity of, of implementation of the, of, the, of the existing directive. So we believe that a regulation is, is a good approach to take. Um, another positive directive of the proposal is the, is the ambition to gather under a same trust scheme services such as electronic signatures, seals, timestamps and delivery services, which should, should in our view ensure coherence. Our main hope, our main concern perhaps, is that we have a, direct, a regulation which combines the issue of electronic um, trust services for electronic transactions with the issue of EID. Um, EID, of course, is a very sensitive issue. Um, it's a small proportion of the regulation, but nonetheless, I think it has the potential, if we're not careful, to engulf the whole discussion because of the civil liberties um, concerns of some people re relating to electronic identification. So I think that's something that the um, policymakers need to be aware of. I think, Mr. Kreutzmann, I'll leave it there, given yeah, the time thank constraints. You. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you very much. So we have, will have a nice uh, controversial debate later on about uh, the common European states' uh, law. But all the other things uh, you are, I've understood you are in favour of what the Commission is presenting us. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. <coughs> Next, we come to Hanne Melin, Legislative Council for Europe at eBay. And she will tell us, I hope, how we can um, overcome the problems with the payment. Huh? Oh, I, actually, I will. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Kreutzmann, uh, and thank you for, for inviting EUVA to this uh, event. Um, the title of this panel is Problems and Complexity in Cross-Border Business Transactions. 
obviously, working for an, an internet technology company, we don't see problems, we see opportunities. So I'm going to pretend I don't see any problems and instead I'm going to zoom in on complexity. Complexity is becoming something of a buzzword. And I want to make sure that its impact goes deeper than that. Because any company linked to the digital economy grapples with complexity. And so any legislation linked to the digital economy needs to take that into account. And in fact, the very policy making process must embrace complexity. And quite timely for this event, uh, there was an article in Financial Times earlier this week, I think Monday, on managing complexity and app explosion. And the article talks about how technology has gone from being the, being the network to becoming a direct generator of revenue, strategy, innovation. And with that, the complexity inherent in developing, managing, and improving technology solutions, that complexity has been let loose. We're here today talking about SMEs, commerce, and retail, and I think that sector is perhaps the example of what this uh, article is talking about. Today, the way merchants make their products or services visible, the way trust is created between consumers and businesses, the way a transaction is concluded, the way a merchant gets paid, all these things are either in part or totally underpinned by technology. So I highly recommend you read this FT article. Um, read it and think, or ask yourself, what does it mean for legislation? Or what does it mean to me as a policymaker? And let me tell you what I think it means. Um, I believe it means a new policymaking mindset when looking at markets and sectors influenced by technology. And I see increasingly, or I hear, at conferences, in uh, the new uh, EID regulation, in speeches. I hear the word flexibility. And I agree. We need to find new ways of making legislation and the very legislative processes flexible. And we need that because of the ways technology develops, is managed, improved. And because these technology solutions and services, they are becoming integrated parts of the business models and operations of SMEs. So what does this mean? Uh, flexibility and complexity in a new policy making mindset. I think we're here today actually discussing a few examples of novel and forward looking approaches to legislation. And for this short, uh, very short intervention, I wanted to flag up one area, but I hope to come back during the discussion to other areas such as uh, CESOL. And the area I wanted to flag up uh, is payments. Payments as an enabler for commerce, but also for those consumers who don't shop online, uh, they mention it as, um, as a as a concern. I'm thinking now about the, the seventh consumer scoreboard, which came out a few weeks ago. Uh, Right now, we, right now there are many innovative solutions in E and M payments, in electronic and uh, mobile payments, being tested and developed. Uh, we, we, we can't and we shouldn't try and predict where markets are going. So what we should do is we should support the very evolution in markets. Because at the end of the day, it's a force for integrating Europe, for allowing SMEs to expand across borders and grow. So if, if policymakers put on their, their brand new complexity hat, um, let me give you three things that you can do. First, you can ensure that any legislative considerations in the payment area are principle and outcome based. This is an area where preferences vary between countries. Credit card, bank transfers, checks, the market has to be allowed to develop, to evolve based on merchant and customer preferences. And secondly, you can be guardians of technology neutrality. 
we mustn't at this point, or at any point actually, uh, single out one product, one system, one method. And lastly, with the complexity hat on, you can go out and be advocates of payment innovation. Actually use political communication to encourage both consumers and merchants to try out new options. So to sum up, what I'm asking policymakers to do is to embrace well, actually, to, to show confidence in complexity, to show confidence in the evolution in markets that are linked to the digital economy. Thank you very much. Now we come to Paul Timmers, Director of ICT, <coughs> addressing social, social challenges at DG Information Society of the European Command, uh, Commission. So you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kreisman. So let me tell a little bit about um, uh, what was just being uh, mentioned, the proposal on electronic identification and trust services uh, for electronic transactions in the internal market, a proposal that the Commission adopted uh, just last Monday and uh, that now will go into the legislative process and about which I'm sure there will be many discussions. Um, it builds upon and uh, uh, replaces uh, one particular piece of legislation, which is the Electronic Signatures Directive, uh, which was um, a joint Parliament and Council Directive, uh, and uh, which was in force since 1999 and is being replaced by this new regulation, the Regulation on Electronic Identification and Trust Services for Electronic Transactions in the Internal Market. <clears throat> We think that this uh, proposal is very important for the digital single market. It's another element in order to get the uh, digital Europe, so to say, digital agenda for Europe in place. And it also fits with the roadmap for stability and growth. And this was one of the initiatives in the single market initiative, that uh, single market uh, action that uh, is one of the 12 fast track proposals. Um, it is intended to be an enabling legislation that uh, helps to unlock the potential that uh, is there in the Internet, in the Internet across Europe. The idea is that uh, it will help to provide trust and uh, confidence in a trustworthy and secure environment and thereby to open the door for more cross-border secure services and for business opportunities. It will also boost the convenience and the trust online, and thereby uh, will help to create jobs and growth and uh, make the single market a reality also in the digital space. Now, what does the proposal provide for? There are two elements to it. One is the mutual recognition and acceptance of electronic identification means across borders. So it's about mutual recognition and legal acceptance of electronic identification means that exist for use across borders. So the proposal, what it does, it introduces a notification scheme for member states so that they can notify to the European Commission any electronic identification scheme that they have at the national level and that they wish to be recognized across borders. And when a member state would do that, uh, it provides access to public services to its citizens through electronic identification and it has this notified electronic ide identification scheme, then it cannot deny access to citizens from another member state using an electronic identification scheme provided by uh, another member state. So it's about providing access. It's not about guaranteeing <coughs> that you can use the service. So if as a student you use your national electronic identification scheme to register for a university in another country, then, of course, you also need to qualify as a student, obviously, to be registered in that university. But at least you can get into the registration scheme with your electronic identification scheme, card or whatever you have, or mobile phone, that you are already using nationally, so from one country to the other. What it does not do, it does not oblige member states to introduce an electronic identification scheme, and it also does not oblige them to notify their electronic identification scheme that they have. But you know that many countries already have introduced such systems and uh, the advantage is that their citizens now would be able to use them across borders. So truly, this is truly about using your opportunities across all of uh, Europe. It's not about creating some kind of new European electronic identification system 
or forcing member states to adopt electronic identification systems. It's about simple tools to make sure that these existing systems can actually talk to each other. They simply understand that if there is an electronic identification scheme notification coming in from another country, that it is actually recognized. There's a second very important and large element to it, which is actually indeed the larger part of this regulation, which is to provide legal certainty for the use of essential electronic trust services, namely electronic signatures, electronic seals, and we can go into what everything means, time stamping, electronic document acceptability, certified electronic delivery and of documents, that is, and website authentication. Uh, in this respect, these electronic trust services that are kind of the services that you need for the full transaction scheme, uh, uh, chain, to go from beginning to the very end, that you can actually complete your transaction. They uh, provide uh, a trustworthy and legally proof environment, and we hope and expect, and that's the feedback that we get, that this will improve the usability of these services. This is also where this regulation improves upon the past um, legislation and clarifies quite a number of things that that led to probably a limited use. So it will improve the current EU rules on electronic signatures by defining the concepts related to electronic signatures, and this with the purpose to <coughs> ensure legal certainty and the cross-border uh, usage of electronic trust services. It does not create a new EU supervision scheme, but it reinforces actually the existing national schemes, systems. And the national supervision of trust service providers is strengthened by defining the specific tasks of the supervisory body, such as regular audits, mutual assistance, and peer review. So this should lead to a more, uh, let's say, uh, hardened, uh, trusted uh, supervision scheme at the national level. Uh, the new framework also lays down the requirements for qualified electronic service providers, for example, ensuring financial resources for their activities, as well as the security risk management obligations, including clear rules concerning the notification of security breaches. So we expect that this proposal will bring more legal certainty for those who use electronic identification and electronic signatures, that it will help to provide for better online public services uh, and government services, and help them to get also these facilities closer to the flexibility, you were talking about flexibility, and convenience needed in the private sector. We expect it will save time and money, and it will actually also uphold the citizens' rights, the right to access government services or participate, for example, in tenders in other EU countries. So altogether, this should help to complete online transactions easier from re really from A to Z, from the beginning to the end. <coughs> more security and trust, and now I go more <coughs> to the business side, will also positively impact businesses, and in particular, smaller companies, which will have simpler administrative procedures. They can work uh, online, they can go into a paperless mode, uh, and uh, the, these paperless flows, they help to increase productivity at a lower cost. To give an, an example, and to finish with that, if we look at electronic invoices, um, shifting to fully electronic invoicing drops the cost of an invoice from eight and a half euros to uh, less than two euros per invoice. So a, a reduction in the cost of uh, almost 80%. And considering that uh, we could then go into generalized European e-invoicing for business to business transactions, this alone could save 40 billion euros a year. So in that sense, we think also that this is really one of these modern pieces of legislation that you need to have in order to uh, cut red tape to get to uh, seamless and, and uh, low-cost transactions between businesses and between businesses and uh, between citizens and governments in the digital single market. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we come to young entrepreneur. He was in the afternoon with another meeting and he uh, told us what problems he has because he is selling to nine European countries uh, here in Europe. And uh, perhaps uh, you can tell us your problems you have to, to, to sell your products. And perhaps you can give us an idea if what we have heard today until now uh, can help you to solve your problems. Mr. Tim Benjamin Kisselzener, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tim Benjamin Kissel. Uh, if you want to hear my 
speech in English, you should. Uh, Alors, je vais parler en allemand. Der Firma Strankhofwerk um Vintage. I work for Vintage Line and we have our own factory in Indonesia and we began our activities 26 years ago. We had a, a market, a flea market, and things developed over the years and then we had premises with uh, two staff and the owner. And then in 2002, we decided due to a drop in demand to sell our products online. So uh, then we, instead of just looking at a town of 400,000 inhabitants, we were then uh, dealing with millions of people. So we were able to hire more people within 12 months. And we then had four full-time members of staff and everything grew until today. And now we have 26 members of staff. And then since 2006, uh, we uh, sell uh, to nine different member states within the EU and we're very pleased with that. We've now got four warehouses and we have got 26 employees and we continue to look for new staff and we're trying to continue to develop our business and expand it within the EU. We're trying to increase the uh, purchasing power and find new customers for our products. The main problem here is the different uh, regulation and different legislation, especially given returns law and different legislation and those different things uh, across the EU, for instance, in Germany, you've got two weeks to send the goods back and then if the customer isn't happy with that, well, then they're able to send that back to the manufacturer free of charge, the vendor free of charge. However, in France, Austria, the Netherlands, there are different uh, laws and they make up a tenth of our products sold. However, it's unclear there who uh, bears the costs. For instance, we might pay 40 euros for a pallet within Germany. However, as soon as that's uh, across the border, for instance, in uh, Switzerland, that might cost 50 euros. That means that that's an obstacle to us exporting to Switzerland. And with online commerce, there's a certain percentage of uh, returns that do come back from customers. That means that if it's 250 euros there, then 250 euros back, and there's all the effort and cost involved, and perhaps you've lost a customer, so there's a huge risk involved with all the different payments and everything. And so that's uh, difficult for cross-border transactions. Furthermore, there are different uh, laws, for instance, guarantees, and so on, and they're often very unclear and they're very different, although we all in the EU live together and do business together. It's not possible to set out exactly who bears the cost for that, who's responsible and what happens if there is a claim, who is responsible. None of that is clear. Furthermore, that's the main reason why we only sell a tenth of our products abroad, Although uh, we've seen our sales increase by nine or ten times, it, well, it's to do with all this and the traders. For instance, you only have an anonymous order and then there are obstacles for payments and so on. And if, uh, traders don't want to sell goods or send goods abroad where they don't have any experience, for instance with the legal situation there, with the different regulations and solvency checks and so on. There are often shops th as well, but they're mostly only national shops. Uh, so that's something that's quite neutral and not s significant for international customers. So consumer goods, we're, we're talking about not niche goods. Those are something that's quite difficult to sell abroad. It's 
almost impossible. There's such a high returns rate. The financial risk is so high. The uncertainty about the current legal situation as well. Those are our main problems at the moment if we try to export abroad. So we're trying to expand to Denmark and Switzerland, France, for instance. And we had different uh, issues there. Or Spain and Italy, that's a little bit more difficult. Unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to exploit that just yet. Thank you. Yeah, vielen Dank. Das ist, uh, that's a, a practical uh, what we hear, but to understand more. Um, and we know that uh, when we discuss it in the European Parliament and we try to um, avoid uh, these things that we uh, can improve our single market. But it's very difficult, you know, the uh, uh, Consumer Sales Directive will be in place in 2013. We'll, be, uh, we'll see if that is an advantage. The common sales law we are discussing in the moment and um, payment possibilities, uh, we know that they exist, but uh, uh, that creates costs for, um, for, for you. So, with the, so uh, excuse me that we came to the late floor uh, to Dr. Garrett Wigmink, Vice President, uh, Business to Consumer, <coughs> Parcel International Production Concepts at Deutsche Post CHNL. Perhaps you can us tell us uh, why the costs are so high. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much um, for this uh, opportunity to speak here. Um, just a brief uh, answer. I, I think you said uh, to um, uh, deliver uh, a euro appellar to Switzerland is more expensive. There is, of course, the customs barrier and all the problems that come with that. That's easy, actually, a lot of work if you have to do custom stuff. Yeah, I have prepared a few uh, uh, slides to make it a bit more visual. Uh, what I uh, think for a five-minute introductory statement would be suitable is to uh, tell you <clears throat> a bit what we think, uh, what our customers would like to have, or what's important for them, and what kind uh, of products we have. If I say customers, then these are uh, basically e-commerce customers who send parcels, yeah, something of the size that you can put on the table, you're not quite like the <laughs> Strandkorb <laughs> you manufacture. And what do they, um, what do they uh, want? They want competitive selling prices. Uh, that's more or less obvious. They need convenient return solutions, uh, which enables the, uh, the consumers to send total or partially uh, their, their parcels back if anything's wrong or you know that from your private life. Then they are interested in uh, track and trace solution that gives them visibility where the goods are on their way, on the road, in the air and so on. And they need uh, appropriate transit times, not actually express transit times but <clears throat> something that matches the distance and the expectation of their customers. Then uh, easy shipping preparation is a point that is all about the technical access uh, to, to logistics service. You need to, some sort of labels and barcodes and so on. This should be easy. Uh, of course, a customer service that can uh, clear up things if something went wrong and uh, they need a liability of the uh, logistics provider that covers the value of their goods. Uh, before I try to give a bit more detail on some of those points, next, uh, perhaps uh, a, a glance on the uh, network that is necessary. Uh, a company <clears throat> like DPDHL, we operate a European uh, network so that we can provide delivery in uh, all European countries. Uh, and uh, what is the, the special thing with that is that we uh, have uh, different cooperation partners in every uh, country and uh, we select them according to their commercial and uh, quality uh, offers. It has turned out that in many countries this is still the uh, uh, sort of classical postal operator with uh, whom we cooperate, but in uh, some countries these are other uh, other uh, delivery uh, providers are better and in some countries we also use uh, DHL Express. Of course the management of such a network 
creates a certain complexity and, and work, and uh, you have to be up to date all the time. But that is, of course, a complexity that we will not let our customers feel, but this is what we manage for them in order to be able to offer interesting things. Um, one point that deserves perhaps uh, a bit more attention is the international return solution. Um, basically, the consumer has received a parcel, <coughs> detects something's wrong, contacts uh, the uh, uh, distance seller, and then the distance seller can provide the customer electronically or by other means with a suitable label with which the customer can go to the local postal branch and send the uh, parcel back. The interesting point is that the consumer, him or herself, does not have to pay for that service. Um, um, here's the, yeah. does not have to pay for that service, uh, but uh, the distance seller actually pays, and all that is uh, sort of uh, done behind the, 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 uh, the scene uh, on a uh, business uh, uh, type of uh, operation. Okay. Um, then there are some uh, other topics. Um, this is other topics. As I said, uh, we have to, to monitor the performance of the uh, operations partners and the transport and so on. You may know that there are track and trace events taken from every parcel during its way to the uh, recipient. And these are millions and millions of events, and uh, we invest quite a lot in business intelligence systems that construct meaningful observations from these track events so that we can uh, monitor the uh, performance and uh, quality. And then, uh, in particular, towards uh, SMEs, a small company, <clears throat> the question is, do they have access to, uh, to all these services? And here we... Um, um, we give uh, already discounts, basically from the smallest uh, levels on. Yeah, there is uh, um, set pricing available, so if you buy 100 parcel transports basically at once, there is already some uh, reduction. If you use online franking, there are reductions that can already uh, sum up to substantial uh, rebates with relatively uh, small uh, numbers of uh, parcels. Um, <coughs> And uh, if you have more than 100 parcels internationally per year, then uh, there will be done an individual price calculation that takes the structure of your goods and uh, the volume of the parcels and all these cost drivers uh, individually uh, into account. And last but not least, the liability uh, for these parcel services is 500 euros, the, the upper border. Usually that covers most of uh, what is uh, in the size and realm of the uh, um, influenced by the um, needs of the consumers uh, in addition to the needs of the uh, e-retailers and uh, the uh, competition that is already there. There are postal operators, express companies, integrators, local things, direct injection possibilities. This competition will still be around and put pressure on us to still improve uh, the products and, and lower the costs, and that leaves us with uh, a lot of work to do. So much uh, for the time being. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, thank you very much. I would propose that uh, we give, uh, give Michael Schotter the chance to give a short uh, answer or reply uh, to Ben Wada's um, attack against uh, common European sales law. Then I would open the floor if there are other questions or comments on that. And then I would open <coughs> the floor to, um, to the audience. I see also somebody who is not so happy with the common European sales law. I know that. And uh, Mr. Schoder, you have the floor. Well, perhaps I've got a very thick skin, but I, I, didn't, I didn't feel attacked. I, 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 I heard some, some comments, and I, and I think some of them are, are very, very um, reasonable comments, and I think we, we listen. Uh, so, I mean, I think that uh, I heard that uh, support for the concepts and support for the idea, and let's face it, the idea and the concept are quite new, quite novel. This has never been tried before. So, I mean... It, 
when you're doing something like this, you have to get it right. You have to work harder to persuade people, and this is quite normal. And this is what we're doing now. Uh, and I think it takes a bit of time for the idea to percolate down, the concepts, the implications. But one thing you mentioned I think is very important, uh, and, I, and I want to be as clear as I can be, the relationship you're absolutely right with, with Rome 1 is, is crucial. Rome 1 is, a, is a, and a, in particular, Article 6 of Rome 1 is a very important uh, protection for consumers, and, and we support that very much. We think it's very good for consumers. It gives a lot of clarity in, in terms of what the level of protection is. Having said that, it's, it's also um, a challenge for traders, and, and I think we heard that most clearly um, when it comes to, say, exporting uh, Strandkörber uh, around uh, the EU. It's not very straightforward. Now, one way of dealing with this was the Consumer Rights Directive, and I'd like to think that some of the problems that we heard will have been improved, for example, on, on returning products. I think you should get some more clarity there, and that's very useful clarity, and we work very hard on that. Having said that, some of the other issues you raised, and you mentioned the guarantee issue, we haven't provided a, a solution in the Consumer Rights Directive. Uh, it was a very difficult issue. Um, and it's not that it's not a barrier. It is a barrier. And I think anyone who's, who'd like to say that this is not a barrier, I don't think is living in the, in the real world for businesses. It's a barrier. We have to face up to it. But how to provide a solution? Because each member state has a, a cherished legal tradition, and we saw this with the Consumer Rights Directive, and how to come up here with a, a, a solution. Because every member state has the best system of of, of consumer protection there is, uh, when you see it from, from the national perspective. What we want to do here is to provide something complementary, something additional that doesn't ride roughshod over these national traditions, which works with the national traditions, which works with the, uh, with the businesses. So only those businesses that are interested in going cross-border would need to invest that little extra to understand this and get the mastery of this new optional regime. But it's an investment that will pay back because this will give you the opportunity to move into many other markets. You also mentioned lack of clarity on, on some of the provisions. Well, for heaven's sake, this is a very detailed text, and I'm sure that the legislative process will provide ample opportunity to finesse, to enhance the text. This is normal, and we welcome it in the Commission. We are open to all constructive ideas as to how this text can be improved, because we share totally the objective of having a simple, clear, user-friendly text, user-friendly for the businesses in the first place, so that they can understand what it is that they need to do to move cross-border, and also user-friendly for the consumers so that they can have confidence to shop online and shop across borders. Um, but you're absolutely right, we need to find the right balance. We have, we think in our proposal, found the right balance, um, but this is obviously something to be discussed. One final point on the model contract terms. We totally agree with you that this is a useful complement to the proposal. Uh, it's something that can add clarity, can help businesses, and we welcome this. We've, we announced this when we adopted our proposal in the communication that we think that this has a useful role, and we look very much forward to working with stakeholders to exploit that further. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to open the floor because of the time is running. Uh, to open the floor to you, to the audience. Perhaps do you have any questions, perhaps to our panelists here, or any comments? Please make it short uh, uh, that we uh, can move on to the second part uh, of our seminar today. Who would like uh, to start and to raise a question? Or is everybody fine? Oh, yes, I was thinking, excuse me, fine. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, please. This is also, again, to Mr. Schotter. Um, and I'll be very short. We, eBay, we also see the Cecil, we, we see Cecil as a tool. That's how we look at it. Um, a tool for traders, it points in a direction which is cross-border. But my question is uh, on language. Because it, to my understanding, it leaves language to national uh, legislation. So you would still have a situation where a trader perhaps would have to translate his, his website. Um, I looked at the, the seventh consumer scoreboard and it, I noted that there seems to be a trend where consumers are more and more comfortable to buy in a foreign language. So 
my question is on language. You said that uh, Cecil facilitates the issue of language. Uh, my proposal is why don't we, in Cecil, specifically let traders use choose which language to trade in? Well, I think we have to we have to take into account the, the consumer protection. Um, consumers need to be able to understand what they're buying. You're absolutely right. Some consumers may be, may be comfortable buying in, 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 a, in a foreign language. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. But I think we also have to take into account that some <coughs> consumers may not be. So that's one ash issue that we've taken on board. The other issue, I think, and this is something that is a great step forward and something that doesn't exist at present, we have here a set of contract law rules um, which is translated into all different languages. That is an amazing uh, tool. And of course, we can go further. We can develop model contract terms. We can uh, add further clarity through perhaps notes. And I'm sure there'll be all kinds of complementary uh, initiatives which will further clarify where there are, inevitably, I would say. We're not going to be able to iron out all ambiguity in, in, in a contract law regime. You wouldn't want to do that. I mean, it would have to run to, to uh, thousands and thousands of pages. So you need to leave some space for rather uh, open terms like reasonable. Obviously, there's a discussion to be had on where they're used and whether you can clarify it further. But some flexibility needs to be left there. But we can introduce greater clarity, and I, and I think that by having this text available in all these languages, and I think we will have, it will encourage a greater confidence to traders in the first instance to, to feel that they have that confidence to move across borders. Thank you. Frau Pachel, Sie haben das Wort. Oops, thank you very much. Ursula Pahl from Birk, from the European uh, Consumer Organization. I cannot avoid to make a comment on the on the European sales law because, as you may know, uh, Birk and the 41 uh, members that we have, we are very much concerned about the approach and we don't like the approach of optional regulation. And in relation to uh, legal uncertainty, I just would like to make one comment, and then I have a question for Mr. Schotter, of course, which is uh, the, the comment is that uh, the Commission says it's innovative, where uh, we think that it is rather experimental, experimental in the sense that it really would create a huge amount of legal uncertainty instead of reducing legal uncertainty, just to say that, for example, the relationship with the consumer regime in Rome 1, it is not clear at all for businesses, certainly a big problem because they would never know if not Rome 1 comes into play or not. There is legal uncertainty about the agreement of the consumer to use settle, settle. If that doesn't hold, what is the fate of the contract? There is legal agreement about the fact, is it fair at all that a consumer gives an a priori waiver to uh, renounce of the rights that he or she would have under national law, legal uncertainty in relation to interpretation. Uh, what would the European Court of Justice do with a flood of preliminary questions which will be, uh, is to be expected? Uh, there will be many, many more years to wait for businesses to receive answers from the court because it's the only instance who can interpret uh, the European say so. The legal uncertainty is, is a big issue. And I am very grateful for the intervention of Mr. Timmers because I think the practical case that he described, it exactly confirms our position which is that if you look at it from a pragmatic point of view, all the lists of issues that you gave, they are either not related to contract law or uh, they are already dealt with by the Consumer Rights Directive, which will come into force or be implemented in one year time, or they relate to legal guarantees and all the areas around that. So what we say is we would rather have a review of the sales directive, consumer sales directive, which is in place, and have decent uh, law that applies to everybody instead of some experimental new kind of uh, animal that will put everybody into problems. I would say, but my question, sorry, Michael, is uh, we talk about the digital economy today. This seminar is dedicated to this issue. And the part of the CESL uh, is really, which is new and interesting, is to introduce new rules for digital content products. Uh, and this is based on the fact that the Commission says there is a considerable degree of legal uncertainty uh, in this area. So if you buy digital content, what are your rights, what are your obligations, etc., etc. But this is fine. But at the same time, the consumers who will not meet a trader who will offer 
the consumer sales law, they would not benefit of any modern rules. So they would just be left in the current legal uncertainty. And for the time being, we don't have an answer from the Commission. How are you going to ensure that all consumers, and maybe also all traders, benefit from, from a clear legal environment in this digital area? Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you give an answer in a short way, because otherwise the time is running, because my colleague uh, Cecilia Malt Wickström, uh, excuse me, is here and she will continue our seminar. So we should end at least in a few minutes. Do you have the floor? Thank you. I always in, enjoy uh, in my exchanges with Ursula. But um, quite frankly, um, I would say innovative, you would say experimental. It's not an experiment. It's something very important. We're moving forward here. We have, and you know very well, we had long discussions in the Consumer Rights Directive about how to find a solution uh, on the guarantee issue, for example. It wasn't easy. You know that. Um, and I think we are, we are forced to, to find solutions. That's what we're look, looking for here. Europe is in a time where it needs to use its single market. It's, it can't rely on, on, on the comfort of, of, of an approach that, quite frankly, hasn't yet, um, in the consumer field, hasn't provided the answer to the single market. We have a minimum harmonization approach in many areas, and we're coming up against a sort of bedrock of, of issues where it's not easy to provide the traditional mechanism of full harmonization. So we're coming up with this approach. I don't accept that it leads to uncertainty. There are some issues which we can, I'm sure, enhance. But on, on the crucial issue of the relationship with Rome 1, and this is crucial, I accept that, I think we have a clear approach. This regime is a, a second regime of national law. And whilst we don't change the Rome 1 regulation, we find a way of harmonizing for this second regime of, of national law, which is the same in every member state. So every member state has effectively harmonized where you opt for this system and where a, an issue of contract law is covered by this second regime, it will be the same wherever you are in the European Union. So in other words, what we've, we have done with Rome 1, without changing it, is effectively to render it not relevant for the purposes of the trader, because the trader will not find he's confronted with the uncertainty of whether or not there's a higher level of consumer protection in another member state. He will know, he will have the certainty that effectively by choosing this regime, the regime has harmonized for these purposes the, the level of protection. And that is the added value in terms of B2C contracts. And quite frankly, Ursula, I'm surprised, and I'm constantly surprised, uh, and also a little bit disappointed that I don't hear more when you e express your, your, your concerns about uncertainty that you never actually state what you think about the level of protection in this proposal. Because actually, the level of protection in this proposal is very high for consumers. It is high for consumers. And in fact, maybe for some businesses, we heard it earlier, there may be a question about whether it's too high. But let's face it, from the point of view of consumers, this is a very, very high quality product. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Because of the time, uh, I would propose that my colleague, that we finish it, and uh, now we come to the second part of our seminar. And Cecilia, you have uh, the regime, and you can share. Me. Thank you very much. Very welcome to this ses second panel on this seminar this afternoon in the European Parliament. I start by apologizing for not being with you the whole, during the whole seminar. I came running from a, another seminar organized at the same time on media freedom in Bulgaria. So there is a wide range of, of activities in this house every day. I can assure you that. Both equally interesting, I would say but from various angles. Now, in this panel, we are to discuss legal uncertainty in case of disputes. That is, in other words, 
alternative dispute resolution, consumer rights, recovery of outstanding payments. I'm Cecilia Wikström. I'm a member of this house, Swedish. And f f since January this year, I'm the coordinator in the Legal Affairs Committee on behalf of the ALDE group. That's the liberal group in this house. So I am very proud to, to introduce to you um, Anna Passera, who is the deputy uh, head of Unit 4 in, in the Commission, and that is a very important unit dealing with financial services and redress, the responsible unit for the proposal on ADR and ODR, uh, that I, I personally look very much to listen to. So I think I'll give the floor right over to you in order not to waste any more time because it's much more interesting for you to listen to our experts that, rather than to listen to me. And maybe we can summarize this afterwards. So Mrs. Pacera, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and give you a, a pre short presentation of uh, the Commission proposal on alternative dispute uh, resolution systems and online dispute resolution system, this package. Uh, it's my first presentation because I joined the unit responsible for financial services and redress um, one month and a half ago uh, in DG Sanco. But I've been working with Commission um, uh, consumer uh, related affairs since five years now and in the Commission 19 years. So uh, let me start. Um, first of all, I want to clarify uh, in order not uh, to create any misunderstanding. Uh, I will talk to you what uh, the proposal of the Commission is about. Um, because, as you know, currently uh, the uh, proposal is being discussed uh, by the colleges later, uh, Council and Parliament, so uh, we don't know what the outcome will be, but I can tell you what is in the proposal that was adopted by the Commission on the 29th of November uh, last year. As I said, it's a package, it's a, a proposal for a directive on alternative dispute resolution and a regulation on online dispute resolution. Um, as time frame, if everything goes as planned, uh, the entry into force of the uh, directive is planned by, uh, let's say, mid-2014, and six months later, the regulation on the uh, online. This initiative, to put in the context, is part of uh, the 12 key actions of the Single Market Act and the ODR, the uh, resolution uh, uh, online is a requirement of the digital agenda. Uh, what are these two proposals about? Of course, consumer protection, because we want that consumers uh, have redress every time they have a problem. But on the other side, we also want to boost confidence. And in this case, we, in our proposal, we are not only looking at consumers, but also traders, because they should have mutual conf confidence in order to uh, um, uh, mutual trust. Uh, the, the college legislator has indicated that this is a package is a fast track, should be adopted in a fast track, that means by the end of uh, this year. That's why we, we are working quite uh, a lot at the moment. Uh, what are the main elements of the proposal? Uh, for the ADR, there are three main elements. Uh, I just summarize. The coverage, the quality, and the information that the consumers should receive. Concerning the coverage, we would like to have uh, uh, the, the, the ADR systems uh, in all the member states covering all the sectors. Of course, it will be up to the member states to choose the different modalities, but we want to have a geographical coverage and sectoral coverage. Quality, and this comes also from uh, the recommendations that we have uh, adopted uh, years ago, we want to have transparency uh, of the system, effectiveness, and the impartiality in order to work. And of course, in order the system to be able to work, we want that the consumers should be aware that there is a system there for them that works. That's why, for us, it's very important that consumers get this information uh, in their contractual um, documentation uh, or in the websites when they shop 
online. The main elements of the uh, online dispute resolution system are the creation of a platform. As I said, six months after the entry into force of the directive, the regulation kicks in, uh, and the Commission is currently developing a platform, online system, uh, that will connect consumers, traders, and ADR um, uh, entities in order to be able to uh, solve these disputes online. Both of these uh, proposals uh, cover uh, business to consumer disputes, meaning also the consumers, uh, sorry, the businesses that have an issue with the consumer. And in this case, we have identified mainly uh, payment problems issues when the, the consumer um, doesn't pay. So in that case, the business can uh, um, address the, the, uh, the system. And because we have seen that uh, the, the, the uh, lack of effective uh, redress has adverse consequences, both for businesses and consumers, again, for what I said before, the trust, and uh, the, uh, in particular in, these online, uh, in the online uh, environment. And uh, we have also seen that SMEs, uh, in particular, uh, have seen that if there, are, uh, if there is a lack of uh, effective means of redress, they are more reluctant uh, to go uh, and, uh, and sell online. To give you some um, figures that come from different sources, I've, I haven't quoted uh, all of the sources there, but uh, if you on request, I can give it to you. Um, we found that about 60% of the businesses uh, say that an important obstacle for them to sell cross-border is potentially the higher cost of resolving the disputes afterwards. And the SMEs in particular to have all the administrative system put in place. And as a result, the internet traffic purchases um, cross-border are, are quite low, it's still 9%. So we, we said that businesses, and in particular SMEs, could uh, benefit uh, of uh, having an, a, a cheap and quick uh, system of uh, resolving disputes. Um, surveys, and here I quoted the European Business uh, Test Panel survey, uh, has demonstrated that 20% of businesses wanted to use ADR, but they couldn't because ADR did not exist. But the ones that have used, 70%, were quite satisfied um, about it. So we think that this adoption of this, this package, package on ADR and ODR will then contribute to reaching the 33% uh, target for SMEs to conduct online purchases by 2015. However, and this I have to say, this was our proposal, but it's now in the hands of the legislator, and it depends uh, the outcome, uh, what it will be, whether will business to consumer will still be covered. I conclude here. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, Mrs. Passera. Very interesting. And this is a brand new field for everybody to get into depth with. Yeah. And I find it personally extremely interesting to find a non-court way to, to find solutions for a common problem, which is really necessary. Now we, let's move on to the next item, to the, to the next, um, next introduction. And I, I will introduce to you Ursula Pachel the Deputy Director General at BIUK. Mrs. Pach Pachel has been with BIUK, uh, which is the European Consumers Organization, since October 1997, recently as its Deputy Director General, and leading the work in BIUK on consumer legislation, a key, for instance. So, by those words, I wish you again welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. 
Um, <clears throat> I will um, speak a bit more broader uh, about the scenario of e-commerce and B2C uh, purchases or, or selling and also what kind of solutions maybe could be there uh, to help SMEs and consumers alike to increase um, engagement. Could I have the first slide, please? Uh, so first of all, just to give you a bit the perspective from the consumer side, as reported by the Consumer Market Scoreboard, so the Commission's uh, scoreboard, which was just presented the new version uh, last week, 43% of, Euro 43 sorry, of European uh, Union consumers have purchased goods or services last year over the internet. Um, and this is a slight increase, but it is quite a big increase if you compare it with the figures of 2004. So e-commerce is steadily increasing. The figure uh, of cross-border trade, as we all know and hear, hear very often, is not so much increasing. It's at 10%, but still it is also slowly but surely increasing. Interesting development is that online purchasing of online digital products, films, music, books, software, is really booming. So 57% uh, have purchased these kind of products online. Uh, if it comes to the barrier of cross-border trade, uh, the reasons we know them since many, many years, there is now a bit a new kind of component here with new elements, uh, which I think come uh, out because they have been asked for. One very important reason for consumers not to shop online is that they think they have enough choice in their own countries, and some of them, 40%, uh, prefer that they, uh, to buy in physical shops. If we look at now the real kind of um, obstacles in terms not only attitude, but why they are worried about if they would sell uh, um, or, or purchase uh, cross-border, then redress is the top, top issue. It has always been, since since we know about this service, has always been the main reasons for consumers. What do I do if something goes wrong? Where do I turn to and where do I get uh, um, help and, and how, how can I deal with this situation? Then we have, of course, payment and data protection issues, safety of goods, delivery charges, that are other important factors. <clears throat> This also shows, I think, that uh, consumers have certain preferences, which we maybe also should respect. We should not force everybody to go cross-border. I think this kind of attitude would also not work. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, just to set a bit the, the scenario in terms of what happened recently in terms of the legal uh, environment at the European Union level, uh, and, and this is certainly something which will considerably um, improve legal certainty, namely the Consumer Rights Directive. And just to recall, <coughs> this directive was adopted in last uh, November, will be implemented by the Member States in autumn 2013, and it fully harmonizes, so really fully harmonizes the main aspects of distance selling, so the main aspects of online contracts with consumers, and these are all the pre contractual information requirements, the for formal requirements for the conclusion of a contract, for distance contract and also of premises contract, but e-commerce more important in this discussion. The right of withdrawal, where we just hear there is really a problem because there is so many differences in the member states. All of this, the duration, the exercise of it has been fully harmonized. Now, delivery <coughs> and the passing of risk, all of this is dealt with. What remains on a minimum uh, harmonization level are the old directives dealing in particular with legal guarantees and with unfair contract terms. And as I've said just a few minutes ago, our preferred uh, policy approach would be to have a separate review of the legal guarantee directive. This is the 99 Consumer Sales Directive and not go for any kind of optional instrument. Next slide, please. So what is the strategy for the development of the internal market? I've only selected a few points, uh, uh, a few points that in our opinion could improve uh, awareness uh, about the legal environment and by that also improve uh, confidence of businesses and consumers in cross-border e-commerce transactions. First of all, to say that we think the Commission does very useful work with its uh, communication on e-commerce, the most recent one on uh, uh, on that was issued in um, in uh, springtime this year and puts together all the different elements that are needed in order to promote uh, cross-border commerce, which has to do with postal services, with taxes, which uh, has to do with many different aspects. And 
contract law is really a marginal part in all of this. What I think is not enough underlined, and I use this opportunity to do it here in this context of SMEs, uh, uh, boosting SMEs participation in e-commerce, is the fact that uh, it seems that the business's awareness of consumer rights and their obligations uh, is extremely low, if I may say so. We know from the last uh, uh, scoreboard that only 29% of the trader uh, who engage in e-commerce domestically know about the right of withdrawal in their own country. I don't even speak about knowing about rights maybe in, in other countries. So there is a, a, a real problem which affects both businesses and consumer because if you have to deal with a business who doesn't know about your rights as a consumer, it's much more likely that you encounter, encounter problems. And I would also like to say that <clears throat> From our point of view, there seems to be quite a big uncertainty and probably uh, uh, not entirely accurate perception of what this famous Rome 1 regulation, this Article 6 dealing with consumer contracts and the law that has to apply if a business deals with a consumer. Uh, this regulation is very often mis presented, we think, in the sense that everybody seems to believe that it means that if you're a trader, you have to have 26 different contracts, uh, which is, uh, if you want to uh, sell across border, which is absolutely not the case. This is not an, a legal obligation. So we think that the impact of this Rome 1 regulation is significantly exaggerated, and there would be a need of discussion and more clarity in that respect. I said already before in my intervention that we would like to see clearer rules for digital content, uh, contracts or all the things that you download from the internet, there is legal uncertainty and we wait for the Commission to tell us what they think they would do um, in addition or besides an optional instrument which, which cannot be uh, the solution for all consumers and for all businesses. Um, and then this is my next and nearly last point, European model contracts. That's, can I have the next slide please? That's an idea that we have been promoting for quite a long time. Um, we think that the current consumer law acquis is so much evolved and with the Consumer Rights Directive we really come to a point where we can start to develop model contracts. Uh, this is um, something which would we, call, we call it a soft law approach, so it's still a voluntary initiative. It could be endorsed by consumer and by business organizations. It would not replace national law, but it would basically uh, inform uh, consumers in the contract terms about the law, uh, and that would be fully harmonized on, I would say, 75% of the relevant aspects if it comes to online selling because of the Consumer Rights Directive. Uh, and there would be, uh, for those areas that are not fully harmonized, you could just make the contract terms meet a high level of consumer protection so that there is no potential risk that you would run into problems with a higher protection level in, uh, in one of the member states. This is exactly, I would say, also something that the Commission had in mind when they did the sales law, just that we think this is a much more limited, much more targeted, much quicker and much cheaper and less intrusive possibility. So we really think the legislator should have a look into that. And last point, uh, alternative dispute resolution. Just to say, we have been waiting for this initiative for decades. We fully support the Commission. We think the text needs improvement, but also we have, I think, seen that the legislators really make efforts uh, and we are confident that we will have finally a system in place which is to the huge benefit of consumers confidence building, but also, and I think the figures are really clear that uh, Mrs. Passera showed, that also for businesses this is a significant progress. Uh, there are three concerns which remain for us, which is um, that those schemes which are exclusively run by businesses, in our opinion, should not be included in the proposal or in the legislative initiative. Um, the legality principle is not satisfactorily yet embedded in the proposal, but we can come to that later and suspension and limitation periods, um, suspension of limitation periods should be considered. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I stop here because I run out of money. Thank you very much, <laughs> Ms. Mrs. Pachel. Now I'm, we are running very short of time, so I, I will go directly to you, Mr. Luke Hendricks, uh, Director of <laughs> Enterprise Policy and External Relations at the European Employers' Organization. 
and representing the interests of crops and SMEs <laughs> at EU level. The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have been asked to um, present our, our views here more specifically on the problem of recovery of um, outstanding problem uh, payments. Um, this is again, I think, an example of a file where this proves that SMEs are often in a weaker position than even the consumers because European legislation and also national legislation concerning consumer protection start from the premise that the consumer is always the weakest uh, part in, in the relationship between an enterprise and the consumer. And we have always stressed that is not always the case and that often, for not say in many cases, especially smaller uh, companies are the weakest part in this relationship. But also, for example, in the relationship with uh, bigger enterprises. And the recovery of outstanding payments is indeed a very huge problem for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, luckily, we had uh, the adoption uh, two years ago of the directive concerning late payment, where we are still very grateful that uh, Mr. Kreutzmann has supported us in improving this proposal of the Commission. So it's now there um, to be implemented at national level, but there is still the problem that um, although we know what the rights of SMEs are concerning uh, late payment, uh, we need to fine tune the different um, instruments at, at European level to enforce also the rights of small and medium sized enterprises. The problem with small and medium sized enterprises is that they, most of the time, they do not have a legal department who can deal with um, outstanding payments. So it's the entrepreneur himself who has to deal with it. And this leads to um, uh, very diverse uh, situations. Um, small and medium-sized enterprises depend also, especially in the B2B relations, uh, on commercial relationships, so they have to be very careful in what they are doing. So it depends also a little bit on the situation of the person who does not want to pay. And there we have to make a distinction. Some people do not have the money at all, so normally it's a lost case. Others are using um, small and medium-sized enterprises to have, um, and this can be both a consumer or a big enterprise, to have cheap credit. They try to, uh, or, or they want to pay uh, the SME so that they don't, uh, so that they get some, some easy credit. And of course, in that case, you can try to negotiate. And what are then uh, the instruments that are at the disposal of small and medium-sized enterprises. For example, in e-commerce, and there it's clear normally, especially e-commerce done by small and medium-sized enterprises cross-border, it is about uh, very small amounts. And there, most of the time, okay, they drop it. So they do not know, do not do anything. Uh, they simply drop the case. Um, when it's about bigger claims, and especially uh, cross-border, and especially in B2B relations there, normally a small and medium-sized enterprise goes immediately to a lawyer, because otherwise he cannot deal with it uh, on, on, on his own. And there, of course, they are, um, we, we, we are confronted with the fact that uh, you have to negotiate with, with, uh, with the consumer or with, with the company. And there, we think that the uh, proposal from the Commission concerning ADR and ODR can be uh, very uh, beneficial, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. However, we think that um, uh, we have to, to stress that there are two essential points in it. First of all, ADR is and should be, as, as foreseen in the current proposal, it should be a two-way street. So the initiative should... Uh, it, can come from the uh, consumer, but also, or from the customer, or also from the trader himself. So this is key for us, and also that claims for payment are not excluded from uh, the scope of, of uh, the ADR. And then on a ODR especially, the online dispute resolution, uh, it's for us um, of utmost importance that it's also open to um, B2B disputes. Um, nevertheless, uh, and, and we have already at, at European level um, some good 
instruments uh, which has been adopted in the last years. For example, the European Enforcement Order for Uncontested unco uh, Claims. Uh, nevertheless, this needs to be, uh, if you want to use it as an enterprise, you need a certification. There is a cost and a time, so also there uh, we should think about how to improve this. And uh, the second one is the regulation concerning the small claims procedure. Um, small claim procedure, so claims uh, less than 2,000 euro. This is also a very, very useful instrument. However, there is one problem. And um, I think the European Consumer Center has uh, recently published a, a study on it about the use of the small cl uh, claims procedure. And there it became clear that in Belgium, for example, that it was only used in 11 cases, and in the Netherlands only in seven cases. So there is a huge, huge problem. It's a very useful um, procedure for small and medium-sized enterprises, but it is not known. It is not known by the SMEs, but even worse, it is not known by the judges. So there we are especially looking to the European Commission to um, do some awareness raising campaigns, both to the SMEs and both to the, um, to the professionals, uh, meaning the judges um, and, and the lawyers, uh, to improve um, this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that you are prepared to, to uh, not to leave the room at 7 o'clock, but uh, 10 past 7, if I could conclude by then. Now I'm happy to give the floor to Felix Brown, the director of the e-commerce in Verbindungsstelle Deutschland, which is the e-commerce contact point in Germany. And it is, I look very much forward to listening to you since I know that you are the, to have the biggest expertise in fields of consumer law, European Union law, ADR and e-commerce. So try to do it quickly and funny. <laughs> okay, I try. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, after all uh, we heard, uh, I think we all agree that there's a lot of uncertainty in case of cross-border disputes. Um, but I'd like just to illustrate how ADR already functions in practice. But before I do that, let's just get back to some problems we have. I was ha very happy to hear what Mr. Hendricks just said. Uh, and it contradicts a bit what I think it was uh, Mr. Butters who said. It's a lawyer's paradise, this uncertainty. And I myself am a lawyer, and I can tell you it's rather hell because if we think about B2C cases in e-commerce, we are dealing very often with cases with very low sums in disputes. So it's very uninteresting for a lawyer to specialize in this field. And if there is a dispute, to go to court in this case. And it's even much more, this applies already to a national case, but it's much more complicated uh, if you have a cross-border case. And then you might even need another lawyer if you're not related like us to a whole network of lawyers. So wouldn't I be employed in Kiel? It would be hell for me. So uh, being employed in Kiel and being publicly funded, it's uh, heaven. <laughs> and um, we recently also developed uh, an ADR-ODR system called the Online Schlichter, thanks uh, first to the federal state of Baden-Württemberg and afterwards Hessen and Bavaria joined in. And now in April also for first time uh, we have a private partner and this also proves this can function. Uh, it's Trusted Shops, a uh, leading German trust seal for online shops. And many of the clients of um, Trusted Shops are SMEs. So this is also a good linking point because as we heard, um, trust is a key. And not only to shop online, but also if you have your dispute. And not many countries in Europe are countries where there is an ADR tradition. And Germany is not, Sweden is much more, Germany is not. So not many people in Germany are aware of ADR. It's very confused. Some of them think we're sitting around a table and shaking hands and after that we have a solution, but it's not like that. So uh, it is very important that an ADR is impartial, independent, provides excellent legal advice. Um, and this has to be assured by a, a 
good rules of procedure, very transparent procedure for all the parties, very neutral advice, so we explain the legal situation, there's clarity, and the parties can freely decide on that basis what solution can be found. Um, I can also tell you some facts and figures about it, because um, what is interesting, even if the procedure is totally not binding for both parties, we come in 70% of all the cases to a very satisfying solution for both. You said 70? 70, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this in only one and a half months in average. I have to admit in cross-border cases it's a bit more. And what is interesting also about the cross-border cases we're dealing with, we, uh, we are working very closely together with uh, the ECCNet, and so I'm very happy that this is also part of the ODR platform uh, regulation proposal to imply the ECCs in this um, uh, procedure, because it works already now in practice, because there is also, for a German lawyer, I can't know every detail from another law, and uh, not even the law itself, but even less uh, the jurisprudence there might be. So it's very useful to get this information from this ECCNet, and sometimes it can also help uh, to, to avoid language barriers, of course, yeah, and uh, really to assess the case properly. Um, the whole procedure is uh, free of charge. I think this is uh, much more motivating for both parties as it's very new. ADR is not known, as I said, and uh, as it doesn't cost anything, they are motivated to try it. And afterwards they come back because uh, of, uh, they see we have really a high success rate. Um, the whole procedure is online. This is uh, not only important in European cross-border cases, but also in domestic cases. Very often the parties live uh, 500 kilometers or more. Uh, and there again, it would be totally disproportionate uh, disproportion to come uh, to a hearing at a certain place. It's better to do it online. And it's very convenient. And I think it's, uh, people like to shop online because they can do it 24 hours. And with our system, they can also compl uh, complain and try to solve the case 24 hours a day. Um, but I talked about 70%. We're quite satisfied with that, but what about the 30%? And I refer to those 30% as our silent success rate because the parties have an assessment of the case. And this leads us to the title of this panel, uncertainty is gone. And from that on, they can decide if they want to uh, try, for instance, a small claims procedure, uh, or a normal procedure, and they will know if it will succeed or not. They have a much better uh, position. And I guess, well, but it's only a hope, of course, if ADR and ODS is more known in Europe, uh, the success rate will even increase. Thank you. I thank you very much. Well, to Im improve the functioning of the retail internal market is indeed something that we all must work on, especially us as, as legislators. And redress, as we have heard from the whole panel, must be enhanced for consumers. ADR entities, it's an option. It's a very good option for consumers as well as for businesses to refer their complaints, aiming to resolve disputes out of court through arbitration, conciliation, and mediation. And I do believe a lot in mediation. If you would know my profession, you would know why. But we have, to, we have to ensure that visibility of these instruments are, has to be increased. People have to know that there is an alternative to go to court. And that is ADR and ODR. And it's up to us to really present it as, a, as an optional instrument. And it must be available to everybody. So the success rate was very good to hear, very good for us indeed. I can assure you that the Legal Affairs Committee is currently working on this as well as on the common sales law with the aim to come up with a situation where consumers as well as businesses can benefit from a well-functioning single market. It's necessary in the European Union in the 21st century. It is today that we must get our house in order in order to meet increased consumers and businesses' needs and demands. 
It is today, when we are in the middle of a financial and economic crisis, that we must be brave and courageous enough to have a vision of the European Union beyond the crisis. And that is why these instruments are so important to, to put in place and have them up and running as soon as possible. I would like to thank all of you for, for giving us your thoughts on this, the experts as you all are in various fields. And uh, I am sorry, but I can only allow, let's say, one or two questions, if necessary at all, because we are already running over time. So if, if there is anyone in the room that absolutely have one urgent question, don't hesitate to stand up and speak up. No one? Okay, very good. Let's then wish each other a very nice evening and don't hesitate to come back to us, come back to the Legal Affairs Committee and to the ALDE group. Thank you for today and for your participation.